He has been relentlessly pursuing Christ over this past year in our internship and has been doing an amazing God, I mean, an amazing job for an amazing God. I know that you guys think that he looks like a Jonas brother on the outside, but he is a Jesus freak on the inside. Can you guys give a big hand to my main man, James Chastain? Yeah. 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 and as people who live a life that God called us to live, we are supposed to pursue Him. Now, I don't know what you think of when you hear the word pursue, but I think of, like, cops and robbers. Like, I think of robber. It's like rob the bank, and he's running from the cop, and the cop is, like, pursuing him, right? And so I was trying to find a good way to explain the word pursue. And so I look it up in the dictionary, because if you know me, the dictionary is my best friend. So I look it up in the dictionary, and it's got, like, 13 definitions. And so I'm like, which one of these do I use? And so I read them all, I put them all together, and I figure out the word relentless, or not the word relentless, the word pursue, just basically means to follow after, and to, to really just like grab hold of and capture. Like if a cop is chasing after a robber, he just wants to capture him and just hold him, just not let him go. And so that's what we're called to do with Jesus. But the problem there is that most Christian, or most American Christians, don't think that we should relentlessly pursue Jesus. Or maybe they think that and they just don't live that way. See, for the American Christian, they live kind of like this. They're standing right here. Jesus is over there, and this is how they pursue Jesus. Kind of like this. Like, oh, hey, Jesus. How you doing? Yeah, I'm coming for you. I'm relentlessly pursuing you. Just kind of walking along. I'm not really doing anything. You kind of get sidetracked. Something over here. And he just calls you back. And you're like, oh, yeah, yeah. I forgot I was doing that thing. And I'm pursuing you. But that's, that's very casual, very awkward, very not relentless, right? And so that, that's not what Jesus wants at all, obviously. He wants us to relentlessly pursue him and just, just give it all we've got, basically. And so I was thinking of a good way to explain the word relentless because many people don't really grasp what that means. And so I figured out that the best way to explain the word relentless is to tell you a quick story about somebody who I know is very relentless. So here it goes. I ran track in the 8th grade, and we were at practice one day. It was a Monday, which were the hardest practices, and they sucked really bad. I don't know why he chose to make Mondays the hardest one, but he did. And it just wasn't just any Monday, it was the Monday after spring break. And he decided that he was going to just work us, work our butts off, because nobody had ran over spring break, because we're all fat and lazy and on the track team. So, we're doing this drill, where we have to run around the track twice, and then we take a one minute break, and then we do it again, and so on and so forth. And we had to do that six times. We had to run around it twice, six times, if that makes sense. That's 12 laps total. But, so we had to do that. We were running around, that sounds easy, but it's really, really hard, actually. You really start to do it. But, uh, so we're doing this, and we get around like one, two, three, four, five times. We're on our sixth time, it's our last time, and there's this guy. And I don't remember who it was, but he was he got like first or second or third place every time he had ran this. And so he, you can just tell that he's relentlessly pursuing the end of this race. And so it's our sixth time, he's on his last lap, he's coming around the last bend, and he, 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 you can just see the look of determination in his face, right? He's going for it, he's going to win this race. And, and so you see him running, and, and this look of determination suddenly turns from determination to like... And you can see something like bubble up in his stomach, literally. And so he's running, and he looks to his right, and he looks to his left, and just goes, and just throws up all over the side of the track, and all over in the grass, and it was awesome, really. It was really awesome. But the best part about it was, and the reason I'm telling you that tonight, why he was relentless, is because while he was running and throwing up, he didn't bother to stop running. And so he's like running and throwing up at the same time. It was a really weird sight, but it was really awesome, trust me. And so that's the kind of relentlessness that Jesus wants us to have with him. And, and it looks weird, yeah, but it also looks weird when we relentlessly pursue Jesus, right? Because most American Christians, as I already said, Christians don't really live that way. So if we're going to relentlessly pursue Jesus, 
we have to find something more than just being what America considers a Christian. And so tonight we're not going to be talking about being Christians. We're going to talk about being disciples. Because let me, let me let you know a quick fact real fast. Jesus never once invited anyone to become a Christian. Did you know that? Never in the Bible will you find a time when Jesus invites anyone to become a Christian. But he did invite people to become what he called a disciple. And that's what we're talking about tonight. We're talking about becoming disciples of Jesus Christ. Because American Christians are just so... It hardly means anything anymore to call yourself a Christian. And so, we're talking about being disciples. And the time that he invited somebody to be a disciple, if you look on your outline, and there's somebody else's upside down, that's Ricky's fault, not mine, by the way. But uh, so if you look on there, I've got the Bible verse. It says, Great crowds were following Jesus. He turned around to them and said, If you want to be my follower, you must love me more than your own father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters. Yes, even more than your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my what? Can you read that word, please? My disciple. You cannot be my disciple. And you cannot be my disciple if you don't carry your own cross and follow me. And so, as disciples of Jesus Christ, as something more than this American Christian that's been so soiled by our culture, we have to be disciples. And we have to love Jesus more than our father and our mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, even our own life. That's pretty intense if you ask me. So, because we're, we're deciding to be disciples, and, and instead of just being Christians, I find it necessary to explain to you the five things that make somebody a Christian in America. If you look on your outline, there's five little blanks, and I'm going to fill those in real fast, about what a Christian in America is, the five things you have to believe. The first one is you have to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, <coughs> to believe that Jesus sent, or God sent Jesus down here on earth to, to do all these miracles and awesome things and all that good stuff. And the second thing that you have to believe is that Jesus died on the cross. You have to believe that he was here on earth doing all these miracles, and then he was captured by the religious leaders and put on the cross and died. And then the third thing you have to believe is that Jesus rose again. He rose again on the third day, and that's why we celebrate Easter. We get chocolate and bunnies that have nothing to do with Jesus, but we celebrate anyway. And the fourth thing you have to believe is that Jesus ascended to heaven. After 40 days here on earth, he was with his disciples talking to people, and he ascended up to heaven and all that good stuff. And the fifth and final thing that you have to believe in order to be a Christian in America is that Jesus is in heaven with God right now, <coughs> sitting at the right hand throne of God, and he has authority over heaven and all the angels and earth and all that good stuff. So you read that and you're like, wow, I believe all those five things. Yes, I'm a Christian. I'm going to heaven. Sweet. <laughs> but there's one big fatal flaw in that rubric of being a Christian, and it's this. According to that rubric, Satan is a Christian. Because Satan believes all those five things, right? I mean, he, he, he was there on earth when Jesus was here. He tempted Jesus. He believes it probably better than you do. And so there's obviously something wrong with what America considers a Christian. Because it, it, it has nothing to do with belief, honestly. I mean, sure, you have to believe to have some faith in order to do what it takes to be a disciple. But Jesus, or Satan believes all those things. And surely, if we're going to be disciples, we've got to be more than what Satan is. We have to have more than what he has, because he's the prince of lies, right? We don't, we don't want to do that. So, in order to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, there's one thing that you have to do, and according to that Bible verse, it's this. You have to love Jesus with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love Jesus with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. And that basically covers everything. So you have to love him with everything, more than your father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, yes, even more than your life. So, if we're going to love Jesus more than all this other stuff, more, more than our, our family, more than our friends, more than our physical things, then when we start to love Jesus with that kind of love and that kind of passion, we kind of start to idolize him. And we start to want to be more like him in every way. We start to just want to just follow his example. And that's what it really means to follow Jesus, to follow his example, because obviously he's not here on earth. So we're supposed to follow his example. Who remembers when they were in like the second or third grade? And they were walking through the halls of elementary school, and you saw a fifth grader, right? Top of the class, just like, you saw him, and he was like the coolest looking guy you've ever seen in your life. Anybody remember that? Okay. Not, not many of y'all. Y'all were like the coolest second graders on planet Earth, but okay. As for me, I was not a very cool second grader. So I remember, when I was in like second or third grade, there was this guy that I knew, and I don't remember how old he was. He looked like he was 100,000 years old to me, right? Because I was little. And he, I think his name was like Ray or something, I don't remember. 
but he was like the coolest guy I had ever seen in my life. And I started to, to kind of idolize him and just want to be as cool as he was. And so I started paying attention and taking these mental notes of all these things that he did. And, and so I started just like focusing on everything that he did and I started to think and like try to copy the way that he walked. Like everything from the, the things that he said to the way he walked to even, I remember, never forget this, we were playing some kind of game and he held up a number two like this, right? Like this all relaxed and stuff. And I used to hold it up like this. And so after I saw Ray hold it up like this, I started holding it up like this. <laughs> and, and that explains why I'm as cool as I am today. <laughs> so if you can really wrap your mind around that kind of idolatry that we're supposed to have with Jesus, that kind of just following and commitment to just being more like him, that's how you truly become a disciple. And so in order to express our love to Jesus, because the Bible does say that in order to show your love to Jesus, you're supposed to follow his commandments. And so in order to do that, I've included three very tangible, very real ways that we can follow Jesus' example in the way that we live. The very first thing where you see where it says three things disciples do while following Jesus' example. Number one thing is touches lepers. Not lepers with the spots, but lepers. Touches lepers. Just bear with me for a second. So if you don't know what a leper is, it's somebody who has a disease, leprosy. And if you don't know what leprosy is, it's a disease that they had way back in the day, and it, it like ate your skin off, and it's, it's like really horrible and extremely contagious. And people would like wake up like in the morning and their fingers would be missing, and they wouldn't know because they had no feeling. It was a really horrible disease. And when a leper would walk into a city, he would have to declare that he was unclean. He'd have to call out, unclean, unclean, because he'd have to let everybody know that he was contagious and so nobody else would get leprosy. <clears throat> but of course, of course, Jesus comes along and Jesus touches lepers. Jesus heals lepers. How cool is that? If you look on your outline in the book of Mark, chapter 1, verses 40 through 41, it includes a story where Jesus touches a leper. It said, a man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees. If you are willing, you can make me clean. We read that next part with me, please, where it says, filled with, it says, filled with compassion. Like, that's the word right there, that's compassion. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Big miracle, awesome job, Jesus, well done. Let's go back to the compassion part, where it says filled with compassion. Now, the Hebrew word for compassion, I looked it up because I like that kind of stuff. The Hebrew, it's some big, long S word. It looks almost like the word schizophrenia, but it's not, because that's a disease. It's not leprosy. But compassion, it literally means in Hebrew to have the bowels yearn. And, and what it's saying is just like, you're filled with so much just sorrow and so much apathy for this person that you're feeling compassion for that you can't help but be moved into action. You can't help but just reach out and help this person. And that's the kind of compassion and the kind of just yearning of the bowels that we have to have in order to, to reach out and touch lepers and reach out and touch the people that nobody else is going to reach out and touch. And so I'll ask you, who are the lepers in your society today? Who are the people who, who nobody's really going to reach out and help? Maybe it's the loud kid in class that nobody likes, Hunter. Maybe it's uh, just maybe it's this dorky kid that nobody likes, or everyone in gaming club at Woodland High School. Hey, not really. <laughs> no, 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 no. Sorry. So I, I was I was sitting on my front porch and I was preparing for this message on Tuesday. And there was this, this girl across the street, and she was on the phone, and she was arguing with somebody, and she was obviously not very happy with this person because she was being very, very loud. And so I couldn't help but overhear the conversation. And basically what I gathered from it is that this, this girl had not paid her rent for her house, and if she didn't pay like $100 or something that she was going to have to pay, she was going to get kicked out and live on the street. And so while I was preparing for this message, I was forced to ask myself the question, if I had $100, just to give to her. Would I give her $100? Despite the fact that I'm never going to see this girl again in my entire life, well, probably not. Uh, I'm probably never going to build a relationship with her. I'm never going to get paid back in any way, shape, or form. I, I'm not going to benefit from it anyway. <coughs> but I reach out to her and give her the money just out of the compassion in my heart. Just because I just felt for her. And, and the sad thing is, I, I was forced to tell myself, no, I probably wouldn't. And, and that's really sad because... It, Jesus did, and we're supposed to follow Jesus' example, right? We're supposed to love him more than everything. And if you love him more than everything, then you love him more than money. And you love him more than anything else that you could give up for somebody else. And that's really what it means to reach out and touch lepers. So we have to ask ourselves the question, 
But we reach out, but we reach out for the people who, who nobody else is going to reach out for. Because if we as disciples of Jesus Christ in, in this Christian nation, you know 92 or somewhere around there, 92% of America considers themselves to be Christians. But America also has the biggest pornography industry in the nation or in the world. And so obviously that doesn't really match up. So if we as disciples in this Christian nation, if we are going to reach out and help the people that nobody else is going to touch, then nobody else is going to. Nobody else is going to help them if we don't. So that's just what we're called to do as disciples. We're called to reach out and help those people. So above all else, we have to love Jesus with our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Everything we've got. We've got to reach out and touch those people nobody else is going to touch. And the second thing we have to do, the disciples do, for following Jesus' example, is build relationships with sinners. We have to build relationships with sinners. Yes. Sorry. There's stories all throughout the Bible at times when Jesus built relationships with sinners. One of my favorite stories is the story of Zacchaeus. And, and it's a big, long story that I can go into detail with, but I'm not, I don't know if you like it. Okay, I might go. But um, the, the basic whole synopsis of the story of Zacchaeus is that Zacchaeus was a tax collector. And so many people didn't like him. Many people, he often stole money from people, and, and nobody really wanted to be his friend. He was like, plus he was short, which didn't really help. But so Jesus was trying... Or he just came to the town that Zacchaeus lived in. And he went up to Zacchaeus, despite the fact that Zacchaeus was a sinner and nobody really liked Zacchaeus, and he had a very bad reputation in his town. Jesus went up to him and told him, Zacchaeus, I'm eating at your house tonight. I'm going to come eat dinner with you. And Zacchaeus, of course, is like, what? The Son of God coming to eat dinner with me, a sinner? And so Jesus comes to his house that night. It's a big story. Zacchaeus repents of all his sins and pays back all his people. And then, But that's not the point I'm trying to make. The point I'm trying to make is that when, when the Pharisees, which were the religious leaders back in the day, when they heard that Jesus was going to eat with this sinner, they, they asked his disciples and said, why, why is your teacher, why, why is this guy that you follow, they called him rabbis back then, why is your rabbi hanging out with all these sinners and these evil people? And, and uh, if you look at the outline, the verse is in Matthew chapter 9, verse 12. Jesus overheard their conversation. It says, on hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but who? The sick. The, the sick. The sick need a doctor. So really take a second to ponder that and think about that. It's not the healthy who need a doctor. It's not the spiritually healthy, the people who have got it down. They don't need a doctor. They don't need somebody to come and talk to them about Jesus because they already know him. It's the sick. It's the spiritually sick that need us to reach out to them and help them and, and build relationships with them so that we can teach them about Jesus. And that's something that many American Christians don't understand because they think that they shouldn't hang out with all these people because they're going to corrupt them and be a bad influence on them and hurt them. And, and, and they're probably right. Because as disciples, we're called something more than just what the American Christian is called. Just what somebody who just believes those five things. It doesn't back it up with any action, without any love. So we have more than them because Jesus calls us in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, if you look on your outline, he calls us the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. So if that's something you read and you look over and you're like, hmm, that's weird, I'm a piece of salt. That's, that's odd, I thought it was a human. But if you really think about that and you really start, start to think about what it means that he's calling you the salt of the earth, you really start to understand what, what he means here. It's like when you're when you're born with this big empty salt container, and you're just you're just empty. You're full of no salt. You're just big empty space. And so the American Christian says, you know what? I believe all those five things. I got saved. I'm going to heaven. And they think that they've been filled with all this God salt, but really they haven't. And so they go and they try to witness to other people. And what ends up happening is that this evil world corrupts them and just makes them stray away from Jesus, and they lose everything that they thought they had. But as disciples, if we really make the commitment to be a disciple, then when we make this commitment, then we're suddenly filled up with all this God salt that God pours into us. We're the salt of the world. And the cool thing about being salt, and the cool thing about salt in itself, is that it changes the flavor of other things. See, if you have a french fry, and you take salt, and you pour salt on it, and you keep pouring salt on it, and you keep pouring salt on it, and then you take a bite of it, what are you going to say? You're going to say, you is gross. But yeah, you're going to say it's salty. This french fry is really salty. You're not going to say, wow, this salt tastes really french fry -y. Right? So th that's kind of what it's like when we're the salt of the world. So we go into these, we, we build these relationships with these sinners, 
and we pour our salt on them, and instead of them changing the flavor of our salt, because we're salt, we just naturally change the flavor of other people. And, and that's, what it, that's, that's why we should be able to build relationships with sinners, and that's why we should be, feel safe with doing that, because if you're really a disciple, a committed disciple, then you should be filled up with enough salt that, that you're not going to have your flavor changed. You're going to change other people. So, we've got to love Jesus, right? You know that. We've got to love Jesus with all our heart, all our mind, all our soul, all our strength. We've got to reach out and touch you. We've got to touch lepers. We've got to touch lepers. Good job. And the second thing we have to do is build relationships with sinners because we're the salt of the world. We're called to, to go out there and preach to those people. And the third and final thing that we have to do while following Jesus' example is something that he commanded us to do. Is we have to set Jesus as first priority in our life. And that seems like a really simple statement. That seems like something that we all think we've got down because that's what the American Christian thinks. They think we've got this down. They're like, yes, Jesus is the first priority in my life. Success. But, but they're, they're kind of mistaken there because when you have Jesus as the first priority in your life, you don't just believe those things. You love Jesus with everything that you are and you're willing to give up everything for Him. Jesus gave us a, a, a good image of this in the book of Matthew, of course, because I've used like a billion verses from that. Under our line in Matthew chapter 13, verse 44, he told us this parable of somebody who really had Jesus as first priority in their life. It goes like this. The kingdom of heaven is, some, is like something precious buried in a field, which a man found and hid again. Then in his joy he goes and sells all he has and buys that field. So that's also something that you read and you look over and you're like, okay, that's, that's interesting, whatever. And you just kind of move on and keep reading until you find something more interesting. But let's take a second to analyze that and really think about what that means. Just, just take a second to put yourself in this guy's situation, in the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is basically saying somebody who's a good disciple. They're like the kingdom of heaven here on earth, living on this earth. So if you are the kingdom of heaven and you have Jesus' first part of your life, just imagine this for a second. You're walking through this field. And, and, and you suddenly are walking along, you're walking on leaves, like they're crunching beneath your feet, and then suddenly you step on something and it's like, you're like, hey, that's not a leaf. And so you look down and you, you brush away some leaves and stuff, and you suddenly find this treasure, and it just happens to be the best thing that you've ever found in your entire life, right? It's, it's this precious treasure that's buried in the field. And so you're like, oh my gosh, I have to have this treasure. This is the greatest thing that I've ever found. And so you cover it back up so nobody else will find it, and then and you go off and you decide that you're going to have to sell everything that you've got in order to have this treasure. And so you first decide that you're going to sell your whole physical life. You're going to sell all these possessions that you have. And you sell, so you, you sell all your clothes and you sell your Xbox 360 and your video games and, and all these precious things that you have, your jewelry, makeup, all the stuff that you have, your bed, all, your whole house, everything that you've got. You sell it all because it's worth more in this gift. And by the way, you're selling all this out of joy. It says, then in his joy, he goes and sells all he has to buy that field. So you get rid of all the stuff that you have, and you sell it all out of joy because you know that this gift that you found buried in this field is worth more. And you have to buy this field in order to have this gift. And so you sell all that stuff, and you've got this huge lot of cash, and you figure out that you don't have enough money to buy that field. And so you're like, dang, what else do I have? What else do I have? What else do I have? You figure out that, let's say in this fantasy world where you found this, this treasure in this field, that you could sell your social life. You could sell all the relationships that you've ever built with someone. And so you think, can I just sell a few relationships? Just the relationships with the people I don't like. And so you sell all those few relationships that you don't really like, that you can easily get rid of. And, and of course, you don't have enough money. So you decide, you know what, screw it. I'm just going to have to sell my whole social life. All these relationships with everybody I've ever had, just sell it all because this gift that's buried in this field, this treasure is worth more than it all. So you sell your relationships with all your best friends. You sell your relationships with your parents, teachers, coaches, everything that you ever had that, that, that you had a relationship with. You just sell it all because you've got to have this treasure. And so you've got this bigger wad of cash and and you find out that you still don't have enough money to buy this, this precious treasure, the best thing you've ever found. And so, you think, what else do I have? I've sold all my relationships. I've sold all my material possessions. What else do I have? And you figure out you've got your mental life, everything that's stocked up in your head, all these ideas that you've ever had about your future, your college plans, your high school plans, your, your fantasies of what God should do in your life. And, and you just decide that this... this gift that's buried in this field is worth more than it all. 
And so you sell all your, just your whole mind, you sell it all. Because this gift that's in this field is worth more than everything. If Chris wants to come on up, we can go ahead and come on up. And so you sell everything that you've got, your whole mental, physical, social life, everything that you've ever had, you sell it all. And you've got this giant wad of cash, and you finally figure out, after all of this, that you finally got enough money to buy this gift that's buried in this field. And so you go and you buy this field, and you, you take this gift out, and you're not disappointed at all. This is the best thing that you've ever found, that it was totally worth everything that you ever had to give up in order to get this gift. And that's kind of a, a, a real image of what it's like to have Jesus as the first priority in your life. Because if there's anything at all that's ever keeping you from having Jesus been following his example and loving him more than your heart, your, loving him more than your father, your mother, your wife, children, brothers, sisters, everything, then you've got to sell it. You've got to get rid of it. Because this treasure is worth more than it all. And until we do all these things that, that we have to follow Jesus' example, in doing, we're never going to become his disciple. And if we never become his disciple, then we're never going to be able to relentlessly pursue him with everything we've got. We will relentlessly pursue him despite the fact that all this stuff is hitting us and our knees are busted up and our ankles are broken and, and we're thrown up on the side of the track. We've got to pursue him. And so that's the one last thought. This relentless pursuit of Jesus Christ is impossible unless you become his disciple. And that's really what we have to wrap our heads around is that over the next two weeks, the next, to the next week we're going to be talking about you relentlessly pursuing Jesus. And the week after that, we're going to be talking about Jesus relentlessly pursuing you. And so tonight, if you would make the commitment to try these things out this week, maybe you won't have that many opportunities, but the opportunities that God gives you, He gives you for a reason. He's testing you to see if you really, really are making this commitment. So I'll ask you tonight, will you make the commitment to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? Will you make the commitment this week to reach out and touch lepers, to build relationships with sinners, to have Jesus as first priority in your life and establish that you would give up everything to have that treasure buried in that field. And, and some of you might say, yeah, I do have it down. I, I do, uh, I, 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 I've done all that. I, I, I reach out and I, I touch those people and I build relationships with those sinners. And Jesus is my first priority. And you might be honest. You might really have all that stuff down. And to you I say, well done. You make this youth group what it is today. You're awesome. But there's still those in this room who might say, that's pretty deep, James. That's, that's pretty radical living for Jesus. But let me tell you something about the word Christian. In, in the book of Acts chapter 2, it says that in the city, the, the, the people were first calling Christians. And when they first started calling them Christians, it wasn't just some word that they came up to them. It was a derogatory term. It was to make fun of them. The word Christian literally means Christ one. And so they were saying that these people who go around following Jesus' example, they're like little Christs running around getting Jesus all over the place. So if you're not living radically for Jesus and you're not being able, if people don't look at you and say, wow, he's like a little Christ running around, look at him, then, then you're not really living like a Christian should live. You're not living like, like a disciple, a real disciple, somebody who follows Jesus' example to live. So there's those who might say, uh, I want to have all this stuff down. I, I want to reach out and touch lepers, but uh, I just can't. You know, I, I just, I've got too much stuff going on. I'm too busy. I'm too, I just got all this stuff. And to you, I say, look at your outline. Look at that last point. It said Jesus as first priority in your life. You've got to get rid of all that stuff if you ever want to be his disciple. And then there's those who say, I, I want to have a desire for Jesus. I want to have a desire to follow all those things because I know that my life will be changed if I let it. I've seen so many people's lives change in the last seven months because they've made this commitment. And, and, and well done again, guys. You guys are awesome. But if you have a desire to, to fulfill all these things and, and to be a disciple, then, then you've got to step in the right direction. To you, all I say is all you can do is pray. And even to the people who want all that stuff but have too much going on, all you can do is pray. Because prayer is our only offensive weapon as disciples. It's the only thing that we can do to, to combat the devil and all the temptations that he puts in our life. So in just a minute, the band's going to pray. And no matter where you stand with Jesus, if there's just one tiny little thing that's getting in your way from following him and having him as your first priority and being his disciple, come down and pray about it. I'll ask the prayer partners to come on up. And, uh, so 
It's when the band starts to play, wherever you stand, come and pray with us, one of us, any of us. Uh,